Welcome to the World News and VOP TV. I'm Kayla Abraham. We'll begin the news with authorities in Maryland, USA, reporting a tragic turn in the aftermath of the cargo ship collision with the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Divers recovered two boarders, identified as 35-year-old Alejandro Hernandez Fuentes of Baltimore and 26-year-old Dolian Castillo Cabrera of Dundalk. The victims were found trapped inside a submerged red pickup truck beneath 25 feet of water in the bridge's middle span. Maryland State Police Superintendent Colonel Roland Butler confirmed the identities and informed the families of the deceased. Superintendent Butler announced the shift from recovery to salvage operations due to challenging conditions around the wreckage. Despite efforts to locate four missing construction workers presumed dead, Butler noted that further search attempts have been halted. The victims hailed from Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras and El Salvador highlighting the international impact of the tragedy. Sonar scans indicate that other vehicles with victims inside are likely encased in superstructures and concrete from the collapsed bridge. The cargo ship owned by Grace Ocean Private Limited and chartered by Maersk collided with, an, with a support pillar early on Tuesday while en route from Baltimore to Sri Lanka. The incident underscores the devastating consequences of the collision leaving families and communities mourning the loss of loved ones. President Joe Biden and former President Bill Clinton and Barack Obama are set to headline a historic fundraising event in New York today, boasting a record-breaking collection of over $25 million. Late-night TV host Stephen Colbert will moderate a debate among the Democratic leaders with performances by artists such as Lizzo and Queen, Latif Queen Latifah at Radio City Music Hall, joining an audience of 5,000. Guests can even secure a photo opportunity with a trio for $100,000, marking a significant display of support for the Biden-Harris ticket. Meanwhile, former President Donald Trump, amidst legal battles and facing four criminal indictments, will pivot to a tribute to falling police officer Jonathan Diller, who was fatally shot during a traffic stop. Trump, known for his staunch support of law enforcement, expressed condolences via his truth social platform and plans to attend Diller's wake. If emphasizing his commitment to law enforcement, Trump's campaign rhetoric centers on issues like illegal immigration and critiques of democratic policy and policies. The contrasting campaign event underscores the divergent approaches and priorities of the two political figures. As the campaign trail heats up, both Biden and Trump continue to engage with key constituencies, with Biden expressing gratitude for police officers' sacrifices, as noted by White House spokeswoman Karen John Pair. The event in New York showcased the distinct strategies and messaging employed by the candidates as they vie for support ahead of upcoming elections. In a recent development, a tragic incident unfolded in Illinois as a man carried out a stabbing spree across multiple locations, resulting in the deaths of four individuals, including a teenage girl. The Rockford City Police confirmed the attack occurred on Wednesday afternoon and announced the apprehension of a 22-year-old suspect. Details regarding a possible motive were not disclosed in the initial statement. Rockford, situated approximately 90 miles northwest of Chicago, became the site of this harrowing event. Among the victims were identified as 15-year-old girl, a 63-year-old woman, and two men aged 49 and 22, as reported by authorities. While the police initially stated that five individuals were wounded, subsequent reports from the U.S. media indicated that the number of wounded individuals may be higher, with seven cited by the police. The United States imposed new sanctions on six North Korean individuals and two entities that generate revenue and facilitate financial transactions for the authoritarian regime illicit weapons program. According to a statement by the Department the Treasury Department on Wednesday, the action targets agents of North Korean banks as well as companies that employ North Korean IT workers abroad. Russia-based Oh In Chong, a representative of Korea Daesung Bank, was also sanctioned. The bank is operated by the North Office 39, which engages in illicit economic activities, manages slush funds and generates revenue for the regime. 
Now the United States Central Command CENTCOM disclosed on Wednesday that the U.S. destroyed unmanned aerial systems launched by Yemen's to the group. CENTCOM said it determined that the weapons that the weapons presented a, an imminent threat to the U.S. Navy ships and merchant vessels in the region. Yemen's Haldi group has been targeting cargo ships in the Red Sea, owned by owned or operated by Israeli companies or transporting goods to and from Israel in solidarity with the Gaza Strip, which has been under an Israeli onslaught since October 7. The Red Sea is one of the world's most frequently used sea routes for oil and fuel shipments. In another development, former United States Senator Joseph Lieberman, a prominent figure in American politics, has passed away at the age of 82. Lieberman served four terms in the Senate and notably ran as the Democratic vice presidential candidate alongside Albert Gore in the 2000 election, ultimately losing to Judge W. Bush and Dick Cheney, known for his un for his unwavering commitment to his Jewish faith, Lieberman was admired by many for his public demonstration of observance while holding permanent office. Following his retirement from politics in 2013, Lieberman remained active in advocating for political reform. He notably championed the no liberal movement, seeking to challenge the dominance of the Republican and Democratic parties in the United States. His efforts reflected a growing sentiment of de disillusionment among many citizens with the traditional party structures signaling a call for change in the American political landscape. Despite facing challenges, including a loss in 2006 Democratic primary, Lieberman's legacy endures as a symbol of bipartisan cooperation and dedication to public service. His passing marks the end of an era in American politics, leaving behind a legacy that will be rem remembered by colleagues and constituents alike. We'll take a short break and return with more stories. Stay with us. Welcome back and thanks for staying tuned. Now in another tragic incident, a renowned Nobel Prize winner, Daniel Kahneman, a trailblazer in the field of behavioral economics, has passed away at the age of 90. Kahneman, celebrated for his groundbreaking work and best-selling book Thinking Fast and Slow, challenged the conventional belief that human behavior is primarily driven by rational decision-making, instead emphasizing the role of instinct. Princeton University, where Kahneman dedicated his academic career until his passing, expressed profound sadness at the loss of the Israeli-American scholar. Colleague and Professor Eldla Shafir highlighted Kahneman's transformative impact and various social science disciplines, noting that his contributions would be deeply missed. In 2002, Kahneman was honored with a Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences for his pioneering research at the intersection of psychology and economics. His theories revolutionized traditional economic par paradigms by illustrating the presence of mental biases that can skew human judgment, challenging the assumption of full rationality and self interest. Kahneman's insight continues to shape debates and topics such as the relationship between money and happiness, influencing studies and reports including the renowned inquiry, Can Money Buy Happiness? Established in 1968, the Nobel Memorial Prize stands as a testament to Kahneman's enduring legacy and the enduring impact of his groundbreaking work. Now, Israel has asked the White House to reschedule a high-level meeting on military plans for Gaza's southern city, Rafa, the Prime Minister, that the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had abruptly cancelled. On Wednesday, officials disclosed in an apparent bid to ease tensions between the two allies that Netanyahu called off a planned visit to Washington by a senior, senior Israeli delegation after the U.S. allowed passage of a Gaza ceasefire resolution at the United Nations on Monday, marking a new wartime low in his relations with President Joe Biden. The suspension of this week's meeting has put a new obstacle in the way of efforts by the U.S. concerned about a deepening humanitarian crisis in Gaza to get Netanyahu to consider alternatives to a ground invasion of Rafah, the last relatively safe haven for Palestinian civilians. 
On Wednesday, White House spokesperson Karin Jemper told reporters that the Prime Minister's office has agreed to reschedule the meeting dedicated to Rafa. Meanwhile, Ireland's Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Foreign Affairs Michel Martin announced that his country will intervene in the case against Israel under the Genocide Convention at the International Court of Justice, ICJ. He says that he had directed officials to commence work on a declaration of intervention under Article 63 of the Statute of the ICJ. The ICJ has been asked to consider whether Israel is committing genocide against Palestinians in Gaza. Israel rejects the allegations as baseless. South Africa brought the case to the court, which is the top court of the United Nations. Interventions by state parties under Particle Article 63 did not take a specific side on whether genocide has been committed by Israel. Ireland will not be asserting if genocide is being committed, but asserting its interpretation of the Genocide Convention. Now, Ukraine launched a devastating missile strike against Russian military targets in the Crimean port of Sevastopol late on Saturday, further debilitating Russia's Black Sea Fleet. The combination of a reported 40 storm shadow missile, decoy missiles and drone has damaged a communication center, the Yamal and the Azov, two Rapashar class landing ships and other infrastructure, possibly including an oil depot. The Yamal was especially badly damaged as Ukrainian military intelligence said it was listen, listening to starboard with a large hole in its top deck two days later and Russian crews had to keep pumping its bows to keep the ship afloat. Ukrainian mi military intelligence coordinated a seaborne attack using Ukrainian Magura V-5 surface drones to coincide with the aerial attack. Now the Kremlin dispatched Russia's spy chief to Pyongyang this week for talks with his North Korean counterpart in a sign of deepening ties between the Cold War allies. Sergei Narishkin who heads Russia's Foreign Intelligence Service held talks with North Korea's State Security Minister Ri Chandei from March 25 to 27. The pair briefed each other on the present international and regional situation and widely and deeply discussed practical issues for further boosting cooperation to cope with the ever-growing spying and plotting moves by the hostile forces. It happened alongside working-level talks between intelligence officials from both sides, which said the meetings proceeded in a common really an amicable, amicable atmosphere. Narishkin is a close ally of President Vladimir Putin, having previously served as Kremlin Chief of Staff before becoming the Speaker of the Russian Parliament's lower house. He has been Director of the External Security Service since 2016. Poland's Prime Minister today hosted his Ukrainian counterpart for long-awaited talks designed to ease friction over Euro Ukrainian farm imports and border blockades by disgruntled Polish farmers. Poland has been a staunch supporter of Ukraine as it fights off a Russian invasion, but ties have soared over the past month over economic disputes, with farmers complaining that imports from Ukraine have undercut prices for their own produce. Today, police Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk welcomed his counterpart Denis Shmigal to Warsaw with Ukrainian flags hoisted outside the seat of government and the anthems of both countries played by the military band. Kiev has repeatedly urged its EU neighbor to ease the cross-border traffic snarls, warning that delays triggered by the blockades would impede weapons weapons deliveries to the country. Ukraine's agricultural sector has been crippled by Russia's 2022 invasion, with many export routes through the Black Sea blocked and swathes of farmland rendered unusable by the conflict. China says it would lift steep tariffs on Australian wine imposed more than three years ago in the latest sign of improving relations between the two countries. The anti-subsidy and the anti-dumping levies were first imposed in 2020 along with a host of other trade barriers during a diplomatic feud over Australia's support for global inquiry into the origins of COVID-19. China had been Australia's top wine export market and Australian wine producers took a heavy hit from the duties which were above 200%. The Chinese Ministry of Commerce says in a statement that the decision will take effect on Friday and that given the situation in China's wine market has changed, 
The anti-dumping and the anti-subsidy tariff imposed on wine imported from Australia is no longer necessary. We'll take another short break and return with global business, sports and entertainment. Stay tuned. Welcome back. And now in business, the collapse of Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge disrupts global supply chains, posing challenges to Nigeria's Tokumba vehicle imports. The closure of the port of Baltimore, a Cree maritime hub, leads to logistical complication and delays in shipments impacting Nigerian importers and consumers. Industry analysts and anticipate increased shipping cost and potential shortages of used vehicles highlighting the interconnectedness of global trade and the ripple effect of infrastructure failures and economies worldwide additionally the disruption underscores the need for diversified supply chain strategies and investments in resilient infrastructure to mitigate the impact of unforeseen events and trade activities and economic stability Now in entertainment, in the world of entertainment, Coronation Street star Helen Flag Flanagan says she was sent into a psychosis after suffering a bad reaction to, a, to her ADHD medication earlier this year. The 33-year-old TV star, who is best known for her role as Rosie Webster in Coronation Street, shared the news on Instagram after a couple months away from social media. She said she was left emotionally struggling after splitting from the father of her children, footballer Scott Sinclair, with whom she shares Matilda, Seven, Delilah, Five and Charlie, Two. She also explained her reason for pulling out of a theatre tour of Cluedo 2, which kicked off last month, saying it was due to a bad reaction to a medication for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. Now, Beyonce has released her tracklist for her forthcoming country album, Act Second Cowboy Carter. On the Superstar's Instagram account, fans were given a sneak peek of her new songs, which included the previously released Texas Hoem and 16 Carriages. The tracklist also contained American Requiem, Blackbird, Protector, My Rose, Bodyguard, Daughter, Spaghetti, Alligator Tears, and many more. One song appears to be called The Linda Mattel Show, a reference to the groundbreaking country performer who became the first black woman to play at the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville. There was also a mention of Dollar P, likely a reference to Dolly Parton, and a track titled Jolene, a reference to one of the Parton's best known songs. And now in sports, the Golden State Warriors claimed a 101-93 victory against the Orlando Magic just by the early ejection of forward Draymond Green. Green received his fourth ejection of the season just three minutes and 36 seconds into the game after dis disputed a foul call on Stephen, Stephen Curry. It was his second technical foul, having earlier argued against the personal call. Green missed 16 games after he was suspended in December for striking Phoenix Sun player Joseph Nurkic. In November, the 34-year-old was given a five-game ban for putting Minnesota Timberwolves center Rudy Gobert in a headlock. He was also suspended during last year's playoffs after stamping on Sacramento Kings player Domantas Sabonis. Despite Green's ejection, Warriors, who sit 10th in the Western Conference, backed up Tuesday's win against the Miami Heat as Andrew Wiggins scored a team-high 23 points while Curry finished 17 points and 10 assists. Magic's second straight loss keeps them fifth in the Eastern Conference. And finally, in sports, ahead of the first leg of the CAF Confederation Cup, the head coach of the defending champions USM, Augia Garrido, is already thinking of getting a win in Nigeria. The Algerian champions will confront Nigeria's representative Rivers United in the quarterfinal of the Confederation Cup. The first leg is slated to take place at the Goodwill Akbabio Stadium in Uyo 
and Garido is already envisaging a win in Nigeria. USM Algiers is presently the African champion after winning the Confederation Cup trophy and also the Super Cup beating Al Ali of Egypt. And that's a wrap on the world news on VOP TV. I'm Kayla Abraham. Good afternoon.